It'll all work out, and I'm sure you'll love it. So, hey, everybody got here at 6.45, so I'm sure we can do it on Sunday morning, too. Um, just a couple of other things. There is a, uh, a prayer time at uh, Planned Parenthood in Warminster this Friday. Uh, that's April 15th um, at 9.30. It is not a protest. You are not invited to come and do anything except to pray. Okay, so please, if you would, uh, just come on down there, uh, 9.30. April 15th, this Friday, at Planned Parenthood. Um, and, of course, the uh, Doylestown uh, Easter Outreach is this Saturday. Um, that's going to be... Steve, what time is that outreach? 2 p.m. 2 p.m. It's not on here. Okay, 2 p.m. You can go all day long. So, uh, 2 p.m. At, uh, at State and Maine? State and Maine. State and Maine. Be there. Aloha. Um, it's a good time to share the gospel with people. Look, we've got something special tonight. Uh, we've been talking about it for a while. Uh, the last time we invited Mitch here was uh, 2017, and uh, he didn't do anything wrong. It's not like it's been, you know, <laughs> five years for a reason, except that COVID happened and all that other stuff. So we're always glad to have Mitch back. And, uh, and tonight, for those of you who don't already know uh, Jason Huckle, you're going to get to know Jason as well. Um, but as we get started, I... I I don't know how many of you have been reading through Exodus recently, but I think it's important always to go back and to remember a few of these things. God said to Moses to tell the people, he said that he was going to, to rescue them out of Egypt. He said in chapter 6 of Exodus that I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments, and I will take you as my people, and I will be your God and then you shall know that I'm the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. It's a, historically, it's, it's important for us to understand, but typologically, of course, it's so important for us because what we see happen with the Hebrew people in, in, in uh, being rescued out of Egypt, it's a picture of our salvation and Jesus Christ being rescued out from the bondage to the cruel taskmaster of sin, Satan. And, 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 so, and so as we... As we go through this Seder tonight, um, Mitch, I'm not going to explain a lot because that's what Mitch does. So uh, how many of you have been to a Seder before? Would you raise your hands, please? Okay. Mitch has been to one. That's a good thing. Uh, how many of you have been to a Seder without food? Okay. Well, this is good. I hope you ate uh, because we're not serving you anything except for communion, and that'll be enough for you, I'm sure. But, um, you know, I, I think it's always important to remember Paul says in Colossians that um, all these feasts were a shadow, including Passover. It was a shadow of what was to come, but the reality is found in Christ. You know, the truth from eternity shining, uh, you know, into the future, and the, a shadow is cast, but the reality now is found in Christ. And to think of the millions of Jewish families around the world who are recognizing Passover in one form or another, uh, beginning this Friday, technically, is when Passover begins, um, but don't have the ability to see the same things that you and I will have the ability to see, all these pictures of Christ in the Passover Seder. And I think this is going to be very enlightening for, for you who have never done this before, and, and for those of you who have been to a Seder before, I know for myself, I've done it many times, but it's always enlightening for me. It's always an eye-opener and a real encouragement to the heart to see what God has done, that God has woven these truths through thousands of years, woven these truths in, and that's just the way our God works. And so tonight, the, 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 the basic overview of the evening is that I'm going to stop talking. See, that was a miracle right there. And, and, uh, and uh, Mitch and Jason are going to come up and walk us through the basics of the Seder. And, um, there, and then at one point, we're going to stop and move into a time of communion. And then Mitch is going to come back and wrap it up at the end. So I would like to introduce to you our friend, Mitch Treisman and Jason Huckle. Come on up, you guys. Uh, where do we start? Uh, first of all, Pastor mentioned that uh, this is not normal. Does that mean I'm, we're abnormal? I'm not sure how to, <laughs> that, to understand that. This is going to be exciting to me. I, uh, I, I, I've been here five years ago and earlier, and somebody just mentioned they saw the video on YouTube, you know, 
That was the other person that watched. It was 27 hits between, and I, I, I watched it 26 times. And so, that, th <laughs> thank you for your uh, support. And uh, and uh, and I love the fact that Jason's here tonight because because it's been going so well. If, and you know, if anything goes wrong, it's got to be on him. Because, right. It's my fault. So, so I'm so glad he's here. Blame it Actually, on the new guy. Actually, Jason's dad and I did say this for many, many years. Uh, 40 some odd years ago, I started to train him. It didn't work. And so, so now we're we'll working. So now you're trying me. Uh, we're try All right, let's give Jason. it a shot. So, um, go ahead. I think you, you're ready to go. Go ahead. Uh, I guess we start with you. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. Um, go. Passover. What is Passover? Uh, it's a special time of year for Jewish people. They celebrate it all over the world. And what you're going to see tonight is what happens in a typical Jewish home that's a practicing home. Uh, not every Jewish family is a practicing home. My wife's family is not. So they're not familiar with these customs that we're about to show you tonight. But a, a re religious Jewish home, this is what is done. All these items here that you see represent something special. And uh, we're going to look at what each item represents, how our Messiah is pictured in it, uh, Passover happens every year on the 14th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. This year it happens to be this Friday. It falls on the Sabbath day, so Passover itself is a Sabbath day. So that, rather than having a separate Sabbath this week, it'll coincide with the regular Sabbath day. Um, with John chapter 6, I, I like to think of that to start as, as an introduction. Um, Pastor mentioned on Sunday about the feeding of the 5,000 and how the Passover was nigh. In verse 4 it says, and you had the miracle with the boy with the five loaves and the two fish. And uh, Jesus performed a great miracle, you know, making molecules, like Pastor said. <laughs> and uh, all these people were fed, 5,000 men plus women and children, upwards of who knows how many, uh, 10,000 or more. Um, you had this wonderful miracle displayed. Um, but after the miracle and the people realized and they wanted to make him king, you had these bread fragments that were left over. And so... Jesus tells the disciples, go gather up the fragments that nothing may be lost. So they come back with 12 baskets full. And most people might not think about what's going on here with Passover and, and baskets of bread. Uh, because the Passover is now, you have, you have leaven, you have chametz, which in the Jewish home is something that has to be removed before the Passover is to begin. And so in Deuteronomy 16, and it wasn't even supposed to be found in all their coasts in Israel. So Jesus was making sure that there was no chametz, no leaven left behind, because some of us are messy eaters. <laughs> so they brought back 12 baskets full of bread to, to dispose of. So uh, Jesus himself um, celebrated the Passover, obviously, with the disciples, um, and that was one of the three pilgrim feasts. You have Passover, and you have Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, or as we know it, Pentecost, and you also have Sukkot, or Tabernacles, which comes in the fall. So all the men of Israel were supposed to appear before the Lord in Jerusalem in Jesus' day. And so in Matthew 26, you find Jesus telling the disciples to go into a city and to such a man and tell him that the master says, my time has come for me to have the Passover with my disciples and make ready the Passover. And so the disciples made ready for the Passover, which would include the removing of the chametz or the leaven, as we would call the berechat chametz, which Mitch has over here a wooden spoon and a feather, which traditionally the father would go throughout the, or would go throughout the house searching for any leaven, but, you know, the woman of the house might not have tied it up as good. So, and then if <laughs> the woman would usually place something obvious, like a loaf of bread somewhere and scold the wife, <laughs> do a better job next year. And then um, after all the chametz or leaven is removed, um, in Jewish homes today, um, you probably have stories yeah, but where, where it was <laughs> what you would do with the with the leaven? Yeah, my 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 you know, the dad would come home and he'd say special prayers, down special garb, begin to search. Mom has already gone through spring cleaning and removed all the leaven out of the house, but she takes four or five crumbs and puts them on a windowsill somewhere, just so um, dad would know when to stop searching. And he looks all over the place, and when he finds the crumbs, mom left. He says his prayers a second time pushes him into a, a, a spoon, wraps him in a white linen, and goes to a central place of Jewish community where all the dads are coming, and, um, and they uh, say their prayers a third time, and then they um, burn up all the leaven, have a big bonfire. I don't know how much of a bonfire you get with three crumbs, but, but anyway. <laughs> um, 
The prayer is, Father, remove from my responsibility any unknown or unseen leaven that may remain to my presence. And uh, so uh, each individual dad is saying, my household is clean. E collectively, the community is saying, we as a people have clean hands and pure heart and are able to celebrate the appointed festivals of the Lord. What Jesus is making reference to is that silliness that my mom, one year, I don't know why, she just didn't do it. And she took all the leaven that should have been discarded. Now remember, it's not just the leaven, but any other product that had been contaminated with leaven throughout the year. So, um, I mean, we have matzah here, and it's not for Passover. Can you imagine something that's useless? Um, <laughs> it's, the challah has been taken, uh, but it's not for Passover use because it came from the supermarket right next to the Ritz crackers, and um, it got contaminated. So if matzah can be contaminated, mustard doesn't stand a chance, and all your ingredients, all your condiments have to be removed from the house. And so you begin storing up stuff just for Passover, and then you get rid of the stuff that's not for Passover. And my mom, one year, I don't know, she got caught late or something, I don't know, she, she took all of the chumet stick and put it in the basement under aluminum foil. And I found it that year, and I was about five years old, and mom, dad, like a thief broke in and, a, <laughs> and put a loaf of bread in our basement. And uh, she said- Hard times. He said, he said, yeah. So she said, um, that's not our stuff. What she did was she, she took the, 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 the uh, take, took all of my, our chumets and she sold it to a neighbor across the street. And if Mrs. Barbieri wants to store her chumets in our basement, I guess it's okay. Then at the end of the week, my mother would buy it back. I don't know if, uh, <laughs> I don't know if she raised the price or not. Any way right. to make a profit. It's a, yeah, it's a way to, well, the Italians are taking, but anyway, so <laughs> it's like, so it's, it's anyway, it's uh, like having 11 and getting rid of it too. Um, <laughs> I, um, I don't know where to go because there's so much in Pesach um, it's a backward look to looking back at God delivering the Jewish people out of bondage, out of Egypt. And that's important to know. But we as believers want to look at the Messiah, Jesus. We want to see him in our Passover as well. I want to mention some of the stuff that's on my parents' table and stuff that was on the table of the Lord Jesus the last, the last night. So it's hard to know what to focus and highlight. But here's something I want to add to the Seder. I never did this before, and it just occurred to me that... In, in Exodus, uh, it says that you, when you, you eat this meal with bitter herbs, your loins gird, and your staff in your hand, ready to move out, ready to enter into the promised land. So I took this stick with me. This good stick like this don't grow in trees, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, That's right. And uh, I just want to get the whole, the whole night, I want to be focused on the fact that communion is preparing us for movement. Move on out and step on out with our Messiah, Jesus. Now, um, I mentioned that Passover is, a, is unique in the Jewish calendar. As Jason told us, it's a Sabbath day. Whenever it occurs, that's a Sabbath. Now, I'm going to ask a question. I never did this before. What are the major Jewish feasts? Do you know them? He mentioned th three of them. Uh, all right, let me do it this way. What is the most important Jewish feast? Yom Kippur, and you know, the rabbis would agree with you right on lock and stock. They would agree 100% because that's the day the whole high priest entered into the Holy of Holies only once a year, only then with blood, and they would be bah! incorrect. Anybody, <laughs> anybody else have a, another day? What's that? Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. I love it. You go up to the Lubavitcher Center up in, in, in uh, New York, and the whole community becomes like a big uh, uh, sukkah booth. I mean, the music is piped in. They have all kinds of stuff for the kids. and It's just fantastic. The lulav, the etrog, the fourth species. It's a great, great holiday. And it talks about our eternal state with God. I love it. And bam, it's incorrect. But, uh, <laughs> and I'm not going to listen about Hanukkah and Passover. Passover was mentioned first. I, the most important Jewish feast, most important day for Jehovah, is Shabbat. And say, now how can you be so sure? Well, in the Ten Commandments, it does not say, remember Passover and keep it holy. It doesn't say that. And every other Jewish holiday is a Passover, is a Sabbath feast. 
Passover is a Sabbath. Feast of Unleavened Bread is a Sabbath. Rosh Hashanah is a Sabbath. Yom Kippur is a Sabbath. And the chief characteristic of Sabbath is what? Rest. 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 Duh, it just occurred to me. If you want to get right with Jehovah, learn this one fact and tell all Jewish people, don't work at it anymore. <laughs> Rest in the finished work of Jesus. It's done. Amen. Amen. And so um, that's, you can go home now. No, really. Amen. That, that, <laughs> that is the chief characteristic of all of the feasts. Relax. It's done. It's a done deal. All right. Passover is unique in that it's a backward look and a forward look. Passover unique is that it's a joyous occasion and serious religious business. Passover unique is that it's a family affair. You go? Sure. Good. All right. <laughs> I'm going to read Exodus 12, 1 through 14. That's where we find Lord speaking to Moses and Aaron about the Passover. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat it the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And you shall eat, let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, <coughs> your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Hallelujah. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Hallelujah. Now that uh, we've taken care of all the chametz business. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have the uh, candles lit. So Anya will light the candles. Say it loud. Blessed are thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us through faith in Yeshua the Messiah, the light of the world, and in his name we kindle the Passover light. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so the lights are lit. The next thing we have is the urchats or the hand washing. Okay, you want to symbolize that? Sure. Go ahead, Mark, you still have <laughs> <laughs> So we have a little uh, pitcher in a basin where some traditional hand washing is done before we get into the, the Passover Seder. Um, do we have that picture? Picture? Yeah, I got a picture up. Oh. Yeah. It's a couple guys. I, I don't know who they are. Wow. But uh, wow. one of these guys is Jewish. I can't really tell which one. Wow. <laughs> it's skinny guys. Maybe it's the guy on, <laughs> on, uh, on the left. No, wait. My left. You're right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's just the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, wow. I, I think the Jewish guy is the one with the very prominent um, <laughs> hat. It's a, with the hat, right? It's, Dog. That's what it is, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. wow of course, that's him and 
my dad doing the Passover Seder together. But there's two reasons why I wanted to show this picture, obviously. is uh, With the Urchatz, we, we talk about uh, John 13, where Jesus, with the disciples, um, humbly um, presented himself, wrapped in a towel, and went and washed the disciples' feet, where the Father is the one that's in charge of doing the religious duty during the Passover Seder, which is kept in the home. They don't go to the synagogue to celebrate this. So the Father... And most fathers are not really educated in religious things, so that's where we have the Haggadah, which is to help out. Um, so the father is dressed usually in what that gentleman over there has, <laughs> a kittle and a miter, which I don't have one, but you do there. I, I, I have that one, but it doesn't fit me anymore. <laughs> it, got, it, it shrank. <laughs> and, uh, Maybe and Maud's asked, got that. I asked Jason if he had one. He did not. No. The, the, the miter is like a, 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 a crown, and uh, the kittle is like a priest's robe, and um, we are uh, out of bondage, out of, out of uh, slavery, so we, we're exaggerating the fact that God set us free by wearing the, the high hat and by wearing the kittle, <clears throat> a nation of priests uh, ready to bring the message of Jehovah to the world. Some of these Miters and some of these kittles become very, very ornate over the years. Um, women take their wedding gowns and re-embroider them and make them again for their oldest son. And sometimes the kittle puts on more and more elaborate uh, things as God goes on. Uh, they pride themselves on how much money they'll spend, silver and gold, embossed into their, their, their Passover finery. And I think it's kind of neat that Everything in the state is to build humility, and we use it for a place of pride. Mm -hmm. Look how clean my house is. Look how kosher I am. And look at how much money I spent on my Passover finery. Yeah. And uh, the men will walk around the table this time, or wash their hands, and then they come back, and, and before they sit down, they'll do like an Easter parade, showing off their Passover stuff. And it's just so neat to think about what Jesus did when they're putting on their finery, uh, he put on a servant's towel. Humility. And uh, came time for hand washing, he w started with foot washing. And you can see how convicting that was. <clears throat> who, he who should be enthroned in, in majesty puts on humility, and uh, the rest of us are putting on our self-righteousness. You see, that's what's going on in John 13. So, yeah. yeah. The other reason why I put that picture up there, Mitch, was um, for the word, for where the Haggadah comes from, where the Lord says that you will show your son in that day. This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. Because we have a picture of here um, how you taught my father. My father then has taught me. Mm. So it's something that's been passed down. That What you will see tonight is literally a show and tell. And it's something that's passed down. <laughs> that's cool. That's something that's, that's cool. passed down. Okay. So hand washing, what do you do now? Four cups. Okay. Um, John had already read Exodus chapter 6. Yes, he did. Um, we mentioned the four I wills, where okay. the first one is the cup of sanctification. I'll bring you out from the, the burden, burden of, the of the Egyptians. The second one, the cup of judgment or a cup of plagues. I'll, I'll read, read you, you of your, your bondage. bondage. The third one, the cup of redemption. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with and great, great judgment. judgment. And this one is a lot of discussion, rabbis, because this one just stayed, plainly stated, plainly stated. This one says... Prepositional phrase with outstretched arms and great judgments. And of course, we on this side of the cross can understand the greatest judgment that ever was. And with outstretched arms and with great judgments, we have been redeemed. And the fourth, fourth cup, cup. The cup of praise or the cup of Elijah. Which I will is. Take you up to me to be a people. The, uh, the Septuagint is I will take you up. I will take you up to be a holy people. So on the four promises God um, uh, gave the Jewish people, they outline the Seder around those four cups. You mm -hmm. want to mention how he rearranged them and why? <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> I know that two of the cups are, are, are partaken of, well, each person has a cup at the table, and you partake of your cup twice before the meal right. and twice after the meal. Yeah. The, uh, the first three cups are about to be accomplished on the cross with the Messiah Jesus. Uh, bring you out from the burden. We read the, the song. Uh, my burden is easy. My load is light. I'll read you of your bondage. Uh, every one of us who's a slave to sin, Romans 6, 
who have served sin, become a slave to sin. And of course, Galatians 4, 5, we have been redeemed. And every one of us understands what it means to be redeemed without church to arms and great judgments. That's the cross. Now, after supper, Jesus took that cup and said, I'm not drinking this cup again until I'm with you in my Father's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the fourth promise, which he set aside, is I will take you up to be a holy people, and I will drink this cup again until I'm with you. And I'm thinking of 1 Thessalonians 4, where the Lord himself, he said, with a shout, Trump of God. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead Messiah shall rise first, and we which are alive remain to be caught together with the Lord. That, I get excited about that every single time, to think that that's in the Seder, all those years, they got the four cups and the fourth promise. and That has don't. a future yeah. look to it. It's, yeah, it's kind of neat. We have a hope to look forward so. to it. The first cup also I find interesting with uh, bringing out from the burden of the Egyptians where the Lord says, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But also for those of us of the faith, um, the Passover uh, today is celebrated at a table like this, but in Jesus' time they were, didn't really celebrate a table like this. They would actually been, have been leaning upon one another. And that's actually one of the four questions which we'll get into. Why, are there's, why is there reclining going on? But it's a beautiful picture of how we are to lean on each other to, as uh, Paul says in Galatians, wherefore bear one another's burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Christ. It's a good picture of leaning upon our, bur our own burdens with each other. Oh, yeah. So, First cup. Um, you should really do this, but I'll scratch it out. Yeah. Baruch Atah, Amen. And they lean to the left and they drink the first of the four cups. And that kind of really starts the Passover Seder with the mm -hmm. first cup. Now, um, the, um, the, the, in the center of the, of the table, I have what we call an Echad holder. Now, uh, most homes will have them separate, and I have my <coughs> Passover plate on top. Now, there are elements on the Passover plate that we use to tell the story of the Exodus to the children. As he said, each, each generation tells the last generation of what, of what the Passover is all about. I don't know if we could ever really identify what one of us would like to be in Egypt that night. If you just think with me for a second, all the plagues have been accomplished, and we come to that final light, the death of the firstborn. If you remember when he read in Exodus chapter 12, it said nothing about an angel of death. I hear that all the time. It does say how I will prevent or the, the destroyer will have no part in you. They died of something and it's personified, but there is no angel of death. You can reason with an angel. You can discuss things with an angel. I myself, God says, will pass on Egypt that night and every household that's not protected I'm going to go into that house, and I'm going to take the firstborn in that household. Uh, not just the firstborn sons, every household firstborn. And we're also going to take the livestock, uh, pets, cattle, goats, whatever. Um, just as an idea, how many are firstborn here tonight? Wow. 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 We better take up the offering. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna, we are going to... We will decimate this crowd. Yeah. We will decimate this crowd. And that's what happened in Egypt that night. It was absolutely decimated. I'm estimating somewhere between 1.75 million and 2.25 million died in one dark night. No plague, no bomb, uh, no, uh, I mean, wars, but this is one night, mm -hmm. one night. And the only thing that saved your life that night was the application of the shed blood of the Lamb of God. Um, so that story is going to be told to us as Jason goes over the Ivan State of Plate. Underneath that, we have three pieces of matzah. It's called an Echad Holder. The undying watchword of Jewish faith is the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is a unity, is a unity. And uh, so the triune God is, is represented here. And go ahead, Jason, I'll let you do it. Uh, the, 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 the head of the household is called the Kekvon, not the first compartment, nor the third, but in the middle compartment, and take out a piece of matzah. He then to wrap it in white, oh, my mistake, break it, uh, it's perforated, there yes. you go. Uh, break it in half, leave one whole loaf, half between the two whole loaves, the other half is wrapped in white linen. 
and buried away towards the end of the meal. And that, that brings us to the fourth Nobody questions. Nobody knows where it is. Which Jason, <laughs> don't look. Uh, where was it? <laughs> and, and that brings us to the four questions, which Jason will go over in a moment. But let me just share something with you. When I was a kid, I don't know what year it was, I saw my dad breaking the matzah. And, um, and for some reason, I said, Dad, why, why do we break the matzah? And my dad said, oh, good question. I want you to tell, ask the rabbi. So they had a meeting on Sunday mornings with about 25 guys, most of whom were ages 40, 50, 60. They'd all be younger than I am now. And, uh, and no kids, no kids. And I was the only one that was dragged out. And I was like seven, maybe. And my dad dragged me out and said, Rabbi, my son has a question. The rabbi says, so this is your question? I said, why, 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 why do we break the matzah at Pesach? Ah, we break the matzah at Pesach so we can recite with the prayer, ha lach which means this is the bread of distress. It says people in hardship, we can build a piece of bread rather than whole loaves. We break the matzah so we can sing the prayer and identify with the bondage and so on. Fast forward seven, eight years, I don't know, 14, 12, 13 years old. I'm playing baseball. I'm hungry. I come home for Pesach. <laughs> I have an uncle named Benny who's a little chipsy, drinks a lot, and, uh, and was singing this song, Ha La Gna, Ha La Gna, Ha La Gna, Why the Bread of Stress. And he's doing another, one more time, Ha Na 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 Na. And I'm sitting there, oh, my stomach is growling, I want to eat. And somewhere I heard somebody say, Why do we sing this stinking prayer? And then as soon as they said, Oh gosh. I hope that was my brother that said it, but it wasn't, it was me. And I, I, and, and I, did I really say the word stinking in front of uncles and aunts and cousins? And my father's doing the Seder and I'm supposed to be like perfect. And, oh. and uh, I took one look at him and I said, yeah, you said it, dummy. And uh, so now he says, go and ask the rabbi that question. So um, now I have to come back in front of Rabbi Jerome H. Blass, the Jewish, Jewish, Berkeley, Jewish Community Center, and I got to go to him and say, Rabbi, uh, why do we sing Chalafanya at Pesach? Ah, we sing the prayer because we just broke the matzah. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask. <laughs> but there's a lot more going on than the Jewish people see, and that's what we're going to look at. Well, I have its tradition. Go ahead. Do the pay say the, the prayer. Uh, well, the uh, four questions. Oh, you do the four questions first. Okay, sure. <laughs> All right. I'll say the first one. Uh, I'll, I'll sing it a little bit in Hebrew. <laughs> this helps. <laughs> and in, in English, why is this night different from all other nights? On other nights, we eat chametz and matzah. Tonight, why do we eat only matzah? The second question, on all other nights, we eat any kind of herbs. Tonight, why do we eat the bitter herbs? Third question, all other nights we do not dip even once. Tonight, why do we dip the greens twice? And the fourth question, all other nights we eat sitting or reclining. Tonight, why do we all recline? And as we go through the Seder and these elements, those questions will be answered. Interesting, though. That night in Egypt, they didn't recline. That's they right. Had their, they, they ate in haste, mm -hmm. and uh, so they've changed it. <laughs> yep. But, uh, go ahead. All right. First one. Uh, Carpets. The delicious Carpus, parsley. And like the four questions, why do we dip twice? Bere pri ha'adama. Yes. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melchalam, bore pri ha'adama. Go ahead. Yeah. Bless you, our Lord, God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit from the earth. And eat of the carpus. Now, uh, what, what does it symbolize? I don't know. I'll tell you. <laughs> Green, obviously, is a symbol of life. And it's symbolized with the parsley, the carpus. And it's dipped into the salt water as a picture of Israel. Boy, that's really salty. <laughs> <coughs> is Israel passing through the Red Sea and thus obtain life through passing the Red Sea? It's also a symbol of the... Um, Hyssop. Thank you. The hyssop. It was used to put the blood on the top of the door and the two side posts. 
and uh, also the salty water is also a symbol of the tears that were shed in Egypt. Life through tears. Yes. Um, second item, we got the moror. If life through tears is good. I'm the guinea pig. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll give you a break on this one since you have to keep talking. <laughs> I'm still chewing. Bray pre mawa. <laughs> Has to be hot enough to bring a tear to your eye. I don't have tear ducts. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try some. <laughs> it's gonna work. <laughs> that is good. <laughs> Wanna do it again? <laughs> no? You couldn't eat another thing. <laughs> Good thing I had dinner. Um, but the more or, um, the more or you eat of it, the more or you know about it. I couldn't resist. I, I wish you had. <laughs> <laughs> I take no credit for that one. That's my dad's. <laughs> but the more or is the bitter herbs. There, there are three items that have to be discussed to make an official Passover Seder. You have to talk about the unleavened bread, like... Mitch said, they ate it in haste. That's why it came out flat like a cracker. They threw it in the oven. It had to be ready to leave Egypt that night. So they had no time to work the dough or throw leaven in it to make it rise because they were in a hurry. So you threw it in the oven and it came out like this, flat or unleavened. So you have to discuss that, that they ate in haste. The bitter herbs, or the suffering and the bondage in Egypt as they were suffering as uh, slaves. And the other is the Passover lamb, which is the shank point of the lamb, we'll which we'll get into. Uh, next is the Chorosis. So I'm going to take two pieces for this. I'm going to make what's called a korek, or a sandwich, something like this. And this comes from the story in Exodus 5, where... Uh, Israel was told that, well, Moses said that to Pharaoh, we want to go worship the Lord in the wilderness. And so Pharaoh thought, well, you must have a lot of time on your hands, so we're not going to make straw for you anymore or cut straw for you. So you have to now cut your own straw and make your own bricks without straw. So it's a symbol of a brick. But it, it's, it's not really a, a sweet uh, memory for uh, Jewish people to remember more labor because you have the chopped up apples and nuts, and it's an unusual mixture. So in Israel, uh, in Egypt, you know, they, they throw all this stuff together to make the bricks. But you don't want to remember that as something sweet. So again, you're teaching the kids, and this is a long uh, ceremony that uh, as you're teaching your children that, you know, this wasn't something to remember as sweet, so let's dip it in the moror. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm making this. <laughs> I can't talk now. Couldn't before anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was pretty brave. Uh, <laughs> um, the the that's it is a dilemma, and um, the rabbis have added the moror to the chorosis. And uh, you had to make the bricks without straw. Now this is a this is like bricks without straw. It falls apart, doesn't hold together. Uh, they we uh, normally have the straw, boil it in water, make a yeasty, pasty water. Now they had to make the bricks without the water, or without the straw, and it didn't. It falls apart, and people got beaten, people got whipped, um, and it was a very intense time. The rabbis ask, why is something so sweet symbolic of something so bitter? And the rabbinic answer is kind of cool because it says that Moses had already appeared on the scene. God had begun to move in their midst. And so the eyes of faith looking forward received the enforced slave with sweetness knowing that the redemption was drawing nigh. <clears throat> to me, that's a great lesson because we know that uh, our redemption is coming too. And um, all things work together for good. Be thankful to him who's God for all things and um, receive everything with thanksgiving and sweetness because God is working in your midst. Both the do and the will of his own good pleasure. There are three extra things on a Seder plate that we haven't discussed. And I tell everybody, well, first, let's do this one first. 
Uh, I tell everybody the only thing we're going to have here is was on the table of my of my dad, and a table of Messiah Jesus. And then we, of course, we have this onion, and uh, we're doing Passover seder's demonstrations in churches, synagogues, uh, schools uh, for over 50 years. And invariably, somebody comes up to me and says, uh, "Where's your onion?" And I say, "Well, you know, the onion was added very, very late." It's not traditional. It doesn't belong to the Ashkenaz or even the Sephardic tradition. I, I don't know how it got on a plate, but my mother had an onion. I'm sure your mother's a wonderful, a blessed man. Yes. And, and, uh, and I, I certainly don't want to negate that, but it doesn't belong. Where's your, here's my onion. <clears throat> Means nothing, but it's on the plate now. Um, two more items are on the Seder plate, and uh, they are uh, the... Uh, the beitza, which becomes hagiga, or the sacrifice, and uh, because that which opened the womb in Egypt was given, that which opened the womb is taken. And so um, uh, it's a symbol of free will or festival offering, which during the temple they had, uh, when the time before, uh, when Jesus had it, but now we don't have that offering anymore, temples and ruins, <coughs> so we symbolize it with the, sh the, um, the, uh, the roasted egg. Um, before I say what I'm going to say about the lamb, what are you going to say about the lamb? I was going to talk about the second cup. Okay. Although, <laughs> although, although the, um, the plague. Yes. Go ahead. All right. The All second right. cup. I'll read you other bondage. So we have the second cup. Before it's taken, though, we have to take ten drops out from the cup. And at the table, red wine is used to symbolize the blood that was shed for that Passover lamb. We have to take 10 drops out because we have to take a little bit of our joy away for the poor Egyptians that suffered for the 10 plagues. So one drop for each plague. We've got blood, frogs, lice, flies, cattle disease, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn. And then... Tainu, you want to... Tainu first? You, well, no, not right now at the second cup. Okay. Even. Yeah, go ahead. All right. I'll sing. Go ahead. <laughs> They've heard me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do the first verse. Elu, Elu, Hotzianu, Hotzianu, Mi Mitzrayim, Hotzianu, Mi Mitzrayim, Dai Enu, Dai Dai Enu, Dai Dai Enu, Dai Dai Enu, Dai Enu, Dai Enu, Dai Enu, Dai Dai Enu, Dai Dai Enu, Dai Dai Enu, Dai Enu, Dai Enu. It's a happy, upbeat song. They try to talk about, had God just delivered us out of Egypt, it would have been enough, Dayenu. But he <coughs> brought us, of course, on the Rishad. And he just brought us on the Rishad, it would have been enough. But he gave us the Torah. He gave us the Sabbath. He gave us a um, uh, promise of, etern of, the, of, the, of, of the promised land. And we, of course, can say many, many more Dayenu. What I do with my kids at Pesach, I have the grandchildren, give me a Dayenu. It would have been enough if I just passed the history test. Okay, let's do it. It would have been enough if I just I got my driver's license. And it's really great to make these kids come up with it would have been enough because God's grace and God's goodness continues to go on. I'll tell you, the vegetarians in the Jewish community, Mitch, are not satisfied. They're not singing, <laughs> they're not singing Dainu. I don't know why. I mean, if we look at the Seder tray, we have, what, seven or eight items? And we have a very vegetarian-friendly Seder plate here. But that thorn, <laughs> bone, bone the, 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 the lamb, <laughs> and I actually looked this up, the, the vegetarians in the Jewish community are not happy that they have something pertaining to meat on that Seder tray. <laughs> so they decided to have a substitute for it. And what's that? They chose a roasted beet. A roasted <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but I think the Passover lamb is a very crucial element to the Passover story. I don't think we can substitute that. What? Why would you choose a roasted beet? Uh, beats me. Beats <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the last item on the Seder plate is the shank bone of the lamb. And um, uh, this lamb uh, represents the, it's the Paschal lamb. It represents the meat of the, it represents the, the sacrificed lamb that was slain. And um, uh, they would take a lamb into their homes on the afternoon of the 10th day of the Hebrew month of the sun. 
The lamb had to be a male in a private's life. It had to be without blemish, without spot. It was examined for four days. On the afternoon of the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, the lamb was slain between the evenings, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Of course, they took the lamb had to be slain, kill the lamb, then take the blood, put it on top of the doorpost on the two sides, and God was going to pass throughout Egypt that night. You roast the lamb, sod it out with water, roast with fire, and the lamb had to be totally consumed. Nothing pertained to the lamb was allowed to remain on the morrow, uh, which was a Sabbath, that had to be taken down and removed and burned. And um, uh, the, 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 um, the Old Testament lamb, of course, is a beautiful picture of the New Testament lamb. New Testament lamb is a male, prime of his life, enters into Jerusalem on the 10th day of the Hebrew month in the sun. Think about this. In the next four days, he's going to curse the fig tree. He's going to cleanse the temple. In the next four days, he's going to be uh, examined. The Pharisees are, in, uh, are going to challenge him, and, the, and the, the priests are going to challenge him regarding his authority. The ruler, the lawyer, is going to challenge him regarding the greatest commandment. The Herodians are going to challenge him and examine him regarding tithing and giving. Uh, the... Um, the Sadducees are going to examine him in regards to the resurrection, and he's going to stand up to all of their, their arguments and all their claims. Um, he's going to preach on prophecy. He's going to do the parables, cursing the fig tree and so on. He's going to do the parables. He's going to promise to return, and he's going to have the high priestly prayer within those four days of examination. Comes before a parrot, comes before a pilot. They find no fault with them. They find it to be absolutely without blemish, without spot. Four days of an examination of the Messiah Jesus after entering Jerusalem on the tenth day of the Hebrew month in the sun. And the last and most important thing about this is that in the final day, uh, the final uh, thing regarding the lamb, not a bone of its body is to be broken. And, and I marvel at that. Um, and uh, we normally do this after, we want to do this before communion. We think about the, our Messiah Jesus, not a bone of his body is broken because um, when he came by, to kill the men on the cross in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts at sundown, they break their legs. So they couldn't push themselves up, they couldn't breathe anymore, and they would expire. Before and had somebody Sabbath. broken Jesus' legs, they would have killed Jesus. Mm -hmm. Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus said, except I lay down my life, no man can take it from me. And when the time was right, Jesus, with dignity and nobility and majesty, said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit and dismissed his life. Old Testament lamb, a very beautiful picture of the New Testament lamb. Now, Jason, I want you to find the Yafi Kohn before we okay. go to the third cup. Go ahead. You remember where it was hidden? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> find it around here somewhere. There we go. Half matzo, which is hidden at the beginning of the meal, is taken out by the child who finds it. And um, my, I would always think my dad was, I was my dad's favorite he gave me a wink and a nod, and, um, and I'd get it, and get it, and I didn't realize nobody else cared for 25 cents in those days. And it's redeemed. It's bought back with a price. My dad would say the most unusual thing, and my cousins verified this, and they said, I, that the Uncle Sidney always said, take and eat. Can you imagine that? At the end of the Passover meal, my dad would say, take and eat. And this particular piece of matzah is what we use to institute communion. Jesus said, this is my body given for you. Why is that? What's, what's, what is like the body of Jesus in that matzah? Well, when I look at this piece of matzah, I see stripes and I see holes. Hold on your side so they can see it. Sure. No, no, no. This way. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stripes and holes. If it doesn't have stripes and holes, it's not matzah. So... Just like our Lord was pierced. Um, Zechariah 12.10 comes to mind. They will look upon me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Isaiah 53 is a beautiful passage. Stripes and pierced. Yep, stripes and pierced. Um, it's unleavened. Unleavened uh, leaven in scripture is a picture of sin. Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians. Um, remove the leaven from among you that you might be a new lump. So it's a leavenless or sinless bread. It's striped, it's pierced. It also comes from a unity, an echod. As mentioned, mentioned 
Shema Yisrael, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echod. It's not taken from the top layer or the bottom layer. The matzah is taken out from the middle layer, which we have an explanation for. Right. The, fa- the Father, the Son, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit is taken out of the layer that represents the Son. Of course, rabbis would have a different opinion on that. But <laughs> they, they say it's God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, right. but, you know, <laughs> why would they break the God of Isaac? Right. Or, yeah. So... so it's striped, it's pierced, it's broken, it's buried, it's raised up on the third cup. And Jesus said, this is my body given for you. It's called the bread of, bread of affliction. And uh, he is afflicted in our place. We don't have to be afflicted. And with this matzah and with this cup, he introduced what we call communion. And um, uh, the third cup. You want to say anything about the third cup? Third cup? The cup of redemption? Yeah. Uh, well, it goes with the promise, I will redeem you with outstretched arm and great judgments. And uh, the Lord himself is called the arm of the Lord. And literally, with a stretched out arm and great judgments, the Lord redeemed us on a bloody cross. <laughs> there <it comes. laughs> there <it comes. laughs> Passover is a backward look and a forward look. And communion is a backward look and a forward look. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death till he come. Passover is um, a family affair, and pe- communion is for the family of God. Uh, it came unto his own, his own received him not, but to many who received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of God, and we're all family in the family of God. It's not uh, uh, Calvary's tra- table, it's the <coughs> Lord's table uh, for the Lord's people in his family. Um, The last thing is that Passover is a joyous occasion and serious religious business. And we were talking about this because for years I've been telling the church, where is the joy in communion? And now I'm asking the Jewish community, where's the seriousness in this Passover? Um, We mock, we laugh, we joke, and it's okay. But um, communion is serious religious business in that we look back at the seriousness of the sacrifice of Jesus. And if we would do the work seriously, the religious business seriously, then we can enjoy the festival of the Lord with festivity. And I just want to make one little mention, and then we'll go to communion, is um, it occurs to me that that night in Egypt, there must have been, there must have been several Egyptians who said, I, I, I want to get under the blood. I'm scared. I want to save my kid's life. I want to get, I want protection. And at the same time, there must have been several Jewish people who said, you know, uh, that Abrahamic cult mysticism, that means nothing for me. I've been a slave for hundreds of, my people are slaves. We've been in bondage. I don't need it. I'm not going to waste a perfectly good lamb on any of this mysticism. And he didn't do it. And can you imagine what it was like that night when the Lord passed over Egypt People are screaming, people are crying, people are frightened. I want to get out of the house, but you can't go anywhere. Where you, you, where, no place to run to. And, and it's that real, it's that genuine, that our lives were that much spared by the Lord Jesus. God is a loving God, but he slew everybody who wasn't protected by the blood. God is a loving God, and he'll spare everybody who's under the blood of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for the picture from the Passover Seder of what happened in Egypt, what happened at Calvary, and what happens in our hearts every time we turn to Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness we have in Messiah Yeshua. Baruch Hashem, we bless your holy name with thanksgiving. We love you. Amen. 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 Thanks, Steve. Look at <laughs> Listen, the guys are going to come around and distribute the uh, bread and the cup. Would you just hold on to them? And then when everybody has them, then we'll partake together. There's a
the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe. Isaiah says this, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, and he has carried our sorrows. And yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he'd done no violence nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he has put him to grief. And when you make a soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied, and by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities, therefore... I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Mitch says that, and he's right, that communion looks back. We look back to the cross. We look back to where the Father, it pleased the Father, it says here. It pleased the Lord to crush his son for you and for me. And we look forward to what's to come. There's, there's joy in that. But there's a third piece, and that is inward. Paul says that, that, that we're not to walk into this in a, in, in a silly way, we're not to treat the sacrifice of the Lord or this time of communion as a cheap thing. We're not to treat it as just a religious thing that we do. But rather to take very seriously, as small as this piece of matzah is that you hold in your hand, as small as this thimble of juice is that you hold in your hand, nevertheless, they are representative of the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for you and for me. And so Paul says we're to examine ourselves. Well, let's take a moment before we go any further.
and let's do that. Thank you, Lord. You ask who has believed our report. We believe, Lord. We believe the report. We believe that you sent your son to die for us personally, Lord. And truly, Lord, Dainu, it would have been enough had you only forgiven our sins. But more than that, Lord, not only did you forgive all our sins of the past, of the present, and the future, Lord. But you've called us something that we never could be. Sons and daughters of the Most High God. Lord, we thank you that we can sit here in relative luxury compared to the whole world and to partake as we're doing here tonight. And yet this is just a sample, just a piece of what lies ahead one day with you in the kingdom. And so, Lord, thank you for what you have accomplished for us. We thank you for this bread. We thank you for the cup and what they represent, Lord. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. And that by your grace, Lord, by your mercy, we're forgiven by your grace. Lord, you've lifted us up and you've called us what we never could be, children of God. And so, Lord, now we partake together as a family. We partake together, Lord, communion as the family together. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Let's eat and drink together.
Listen, um, I'm going to turn this over back to, to Mitch and Jason in a moment. But before I do, this, this. Um, no doubt there are some of you in here who have never given your lives to Jesus Christ. And, and you've listened to a great presentation. There's been humor. It's fun. There's, I mean, it's, it's an amazing picture at what God has done through so many people, the Jewish people, and now into the church among us Gentiles, as well as the Jewish people over thousands of years. And yet through it all is a theme. And the theme is you're in slavery. The theme is that you are trapped. The theme is that you are in bondage and you'll never get yourself out unless God himself delivers you. And he has already made that provision. God the Father sent his son to pay the price for your sins because it's your sins just as well as my sins. It's your sin that has kept you in that place and there's not a thing you can do about it. You can try to clean all the hummets out of your life, all that, all that yeast, all that leaven, which is a picture of your sin. We can try to clean, clean our house. We can try to sell it to a Gentile neighbor for a dollar on the condition. We can bring it back later on. God sees through all of that. All that is religion. And in the meantime, you are dying and you are strangling and you are suffering because of the bondage that you're in, because of your sin. And I'm not picking on you. I'm saying that you are part of the common problem to all mankind. And yet, there's a rescue for you, and there's only one way, and his name is Jesus, the Messiah of the world, Jesus Christ. So don't leave here tonight without making sure that you have taken care of that, that you have come to him for the exchange that he offers. And that's simply this. Hear it clearly. God sent his son to pay the price for your sins. And if you will believe, if you will accept the fact that he paid that price on your behalf, that he will remove that sin from you just as he has from me and from the rest of us in here, you can have everlasting life. You can have a new life. Not a revision of life, a brand new life. And you can have the guarantee of heaven, and you have a confidence of new things like you've never experienced before. And all you have to do is pray, God, I know I'm a sinner. I come to you, and I ask forgiveness for my sins. I want new life. And I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord. And I want to walk with him and be the man or the woman that you desire me to be. If that's your desire, you come and find me or Mitch or Jason or someone on the worship team or one of the prayer partners up here later on, and we will pray with you. We'll explain what you don't understand, and you can know tonight when you walk out of here that you have brand new life, that you're born again. Amen. Amen. All right, now I'm going to turn this over to Mitch and Jason for the key, the fourth cup. So would you all take a seat? We're going to do that, and then we'll finish up with a couple of songs. You guys know what to do. <laughs> I think. <sighs> I'm just going to sit down in Elijah's chair. Relax. Okay. Hope you do a good job. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get the passage here. <clears throat> The fourth cup is called the cup of praise or the cup of Elijah. I will that's, take you up. That's that not is the right Elijah's one. cup. That's the fourth cup. And right here. Yeah. There you go. What's that cup? That's Elijah's cup. Oh, okay. That's the fourth cup. This is the cup of Elijah. All right. You're Elijah. <laughs> Eliyahu. <laughs> Kuz. Yeah. Right. The fourth cup, I will take you up to me to be a people with the promise that uh, we have something to look forward to that day when we're all taken up. And uh, the passage that comes to mind is 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I hope that we have something to look forward to as we look forward to the future the resurrection together where we'll meet the Lord in the air. And I'm um, looking forward to the, marriage, the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb where the Lord said, I will not drink of the cup of wine 
again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So something that we have to look forward to. In the Jewish home, every year there's a, an empty place setting left for Elijah, with a full plate and silverware and everything, sure. hoping that uh, Elijah will show up and the Jewish people know that he's supposed to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, as the prophet Malachi had said. And so it's tradition that in the Jewish home, they have someone, usually the youngest or one of the children, go look for Elijah. And so, Mitch, I believe you have a story about that. A story about everything. Yeah, I know you too. <laughs> Yours yeah. is based on experience. Yeah. When I was, uh, one year, we did Passover in uh, Brooklyn. And the reason we did it in Brooklyn is because we lived in Jersey at the time, and the people from Long Island, that's correctly pronounced, Long Island, were, <laughs> were complaining about having to travel all the way over. So we decided to do it in Brooklyn at my grandma's house, my mother's mother's house. And um, my mother never wanted to do it there because her mother's not clean enough. Nobody's clean enough for my mother. And uh, seriously, the, she went there weeks in advance cleaning out grandma's apartment, making it suitable for Pesach. And um, we, it was a smaller apartment, so we couldn't sit at the table. So I was sitting at a piano bench with... Um, my two cousins, my cousin Bobby and my cousin Greta. And even though we were little kids, you still can't eat on a piano bench. So, And at the head table, there was an empty chair <laughs> with a full <laughs> accoutrement. And I'm thinking, gee, somebody, somebody can move over there. Right. And, uh, and I asked, and he said, it's for Elijah. I don't want to ask a lot of questions, because I don't have to go back before the rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking, so I'm thinking. You know what? I must have an uncle named Elijah who I didn't know, but's coming just because it's in Brooklyn. And uh, and I heard Uncle Sammy complaining about the traffic on the LIE, and I just put it together that my mind that it's really he's running late. Right, it's late. So He'll my be there. brother is eight years older than I. I'm like five. He's like thirteen. And when he realized that I actually thought there was a real person to look for, he had a ball. He said, Mitch, go look for Elijah. So I said, okay. I mean, we want to conclude the service without him. And I, um, I went out to the foyer. He said, you can't find anybody on the floor. Go downstairs. Now it's Pesach, and we can't use the elevator. It's only the sixth floor. So I run down to the sixth floor. I look around the lobby. I don't see nothing. I come back up. Did you check out on Notion Avenue? I come in there laughing and giggling. I don't know. So I go back downstairs, look out on Notion Avenue. I don't see I come back. And he's had me go down three different times. And every time I come up there laughing and laughing, I don't know what they're laughing at. And um, finally, on one of my trips, I thought I saw him, and I could see him from the window. And I said, there he is. Boy, did they jump. They, <laughs> but... but it was just, just somebody coming home late for work and stuff. But good news, uh, by the way. Um, but how many Russian-speaking people have come to the Lord through Passover Seder? Just as a little side. I don't know, Anya. Do you know? <laughs> Every year there's like three, four. It's amazing. Praise God, yeah. Baruch Hashem. Yeah, we're having a good turnout this year, so yeah. keep that. One of, one of the uh, last, uh, last time I was here, I think my, my cousin Greta had accepted the Lord. She was one of the girls at that uh, piano bench. My cousin Barbara didn't come out to a lot of seders, but she did. And just recently, my cousin Barbara, who's in San Francisco, has accepted the Lord. The only one left now is my brother and my cousin Bobby. And uh, we just pray for them every day for the last 65 years. And no, honestly, and um, we believe that the Lord's working in their hearts and lives. I don't suppose anybody could become naive like a little child expecting your redemption to draw an eye, expecting Elijah to be coming in your midst. But sometimes that attitude is, is necessary. We live in very, very troublous times. I got the staff here because I think once we take communion, we're not done. We're not done. There's a whole generation of people out there who don't know Jesus Christ, and we're living in what might be the very last of days. Um, Israel's back in the land. Jerusalem is where it ought to be now under Jewish hands. We always say next year in Jerusalem. We've been living Passover seders in Jerusalem for 
25 years now. I don't know, the 1960s, th the war. Yeah. It's, uh, it's 67, so it's at 30, uh, 33 and 25, 50 some odd years. We are living, uh, Hebrew says that these are the last days. If Hebrews is in the last days, you can only imagine how much closer it is to our redemption, which is drawing nigh. I think we should get excited about it. Yeah. I think we should be enthused about it. And I think we should be looking for every opportunity to speak up by lip, by life, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jason, thank you so very, very much. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. And, uh, that's great. Yes. Thank you, Father, for this congregation, their worship, their praise, their adoration and their faith in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead and stand with me.